Welcome to the Sound of Movement podcast. Today we're going deeper into nutrition and we're going to be talking about intermittent fasting, gut health, and performance. These three things are linked together in ways that if you understand, you are going to see some real improvement in your training. Oh, listen to this guy. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. Just get us back on the um, real back. How are you guys? Sorry, we have a little bit of sound issue going on up there with Richie. Uh, we are Unity Gym, if you haven't noticed already. Uh, my name is Yanni <laughs> Bormeister. Across the table from me, thanks, Captain Obvious. Across the table from me is uh, ra my brother Rad. Next to me is Phil White, our resident physiotherapist, smartest man in the room. And behind the uh the, the the technical glitches going on up there is our our amazing tech whiz richie the sexiest man in the room now uh what we want to do quickly is send some love out to everyone listening in on the podcast i know we do stream these uh live to our ums uh facebook group our movement mastermind facebook group if you haven't already get over there join the discussion live um, but we're looking at the, the metrics of our podcast this week because we're doing our annual planning and it's really cool to see it growing. So thank you very much. I do want to uh, ask you a huge favor, very big favor. If you're listening on Apple, uh, in the Apple, what is it? The Apple podcast yep. app, Apple um, podcast up. please give us iTunes. a five star review and, uh, and, and leave a little comment. If you hit five stars, that's awesome. But if you leave a little comment that even helps us too. just tell people about the podcast, about your experience, maybe something you've learned. Yeah. We've, uh, we've got a bunch of, rev uh, ratings up there, but we've only got one review and that was back from, uh, Valentine's day last year from war three, five, one. Yeah. Thank you. Nine things to say. So. Thank you very um, much. There and give us some more. Whoever um, you are and wherever you are in the world. And uh, much love to everyone uh, tuning in on the YouTube channel. I know we, uh, we've neglected you with our weekend workouts last year. It just got a bit much for us with COVID and everything, but we are going to kick that off again this year. We've got some good stuff planned for you guys too. So smash that like button if that excites you. And uh, let us know in the comments section on YouTube and, of course, everyone on the UMS Movement Mastermind group, Question of the day, have you ever tried intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating? We're going to talk about the difference between those two today. And if so, how did you find it? What were the results you got? How did it make you feel? We want to know all about it in the comments section. Now, I have to say my little disclaimer before we get started on any nutrition uh, discussion. No one in this room right now is a dietitian or a nutritionist, as we would call it. Phil has a uh, exercise uh, and sports science degree. I have done a you know, shotgun nutrition course. Uh, and other than that, we're all just personal trainers and we are passionate about nutrition. I'm a physio. And, and, and Phil's a <laughs> physiotherapist. And I've got a PhD. But <laughs> <laughs> in being a dick. <laughs> I've got uh, a PhD in baloney. Baloney, that's right. So just... Please, you know, what we say, take it with a grain of salt. Um, um, you, you can definitely learn from us. You can learn from our experiences. You can learn from our knowledge and wisdom. But if you have a specific issue that is related to nutrition, I do urge you guys to do exactly what we say if you've got an injury and you um, hear us talk about injury management or um, injury uh, sort of help, uh, we recommend you to see a physiotherapist. Today, we recommend that you see a dietitian or a, uh, a qualified nutritionist if you have a very specific issue that you need help with around nutrition or if you just want a customized diet, you know. It's, it's uh, well worth seeking help from the professionals. How are we all this morning? Yeah, just another one on that. And another case is if you do have some health conditions that may impact your um, you know, eating. So if generalized advice is maybe not right for you, then yeah. Mm. Yeah, going well. That's exactly right. How are you, Rad? Yeah, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. Yeah. How's that PhD? <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, keeping me uh, on top of all things baloney. All things baloney. Uh, all <laughs> things baloney. How are you, Richie? You got your uh, tech sorted? Yeah, um, it's fine. <laughs> yep. For some yeah, reason, um, all of a sudden, the... Uh, the it's because people keep touching my shit up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, all of a sudden, uh, the uh, the sound started coming out of one of Richie's m m monitors up there. He's got a a, a world of uh, like it's a pretty a, elaborate setup. a wealth of different <laughs> monitors up there that yeah. he's looking at, and uh, yeah, we had a little bit of uh, something something going on. So 
We're cramming two topics into one today, and it's good because they both correlate with our, each other. But just to give a quick recap this week, we have been sharing our biggest uh, sort of, I guess, lowest hanging fruit steps that you can take to um, impact your nutrition. We have a brand new group of um, awesome tribe members starting our 28 day intensive this week, and we want to cover some base level uh, nutrition principles. We call them the five laws of a great diet. I'll quickly recap. Uh, on on the Tuesday, we spoke about balancing energy to optimize your physique. That's obviously uh, calories in versus calories out matters. Uh, on Wednesday, we spoke about how to reduce or minimize systemic inflammation, and that was very important. We shared a couple of resources, great resources yesterday in the comment section. If you haven't checked that one out, check it out. Today, we're talking about how to upregulate your healing pathways and how to build or and cultivate a healthy gut microbiome. Now, the key principle or the, um, the first step that we use to intervene as an intervention for people's diet here at Unity Gym crosses over to every single one of these, which is to eliminate processed food. That's processed carbs, processed fats, and processed sugars. Neither of them should be vilified any more than the other. It's usually just a general combination of all three of those that uh, can become really problematic in the body. Uh, and that is going to help minimize your energy intake because processed foods generally have very little fiber, which generally increases the amount you consume. And uh, I, I'll give you an example of that. You know, you go to a hamburger store and you eat a hamburger, you can often feel hungry after eating that hamburger, even though you've just had a calorie laden <laughs> meal. The hamburger is probably in excess of 750 calories if it's a decent burger. Uh, if you tried to eat 750 calories of broccoli, man, you'd feel full. Uh, so there's, that's just a, a, bad time. a little example. Rad used another example of, of the difference between eating apples and apple and drinking apple juice. You know, about eight apples go into a glass of apple juice. Try eating eight apples. You'd struggle. And the reason is because there's a lot of fiber in apples. So next we talked about reducing uh, systemic inflammation. And how do we do that? We reduce the amount of processed foods that you're eating, especially processed carbohydrates and sugars. Uh, but it's, it's really the same rule applies. And now today we're going to repeat that rule and say the same thing again, because one of the best ways to cultivate a healthy gut microbiome is to eat a variety of whole foods. Yeah. Which I think like, you know, sometimes it's going to be a bit like, oh, it's so simple. And that's almost like makes it less important, but really it's like <laughs> just such a key thing to understand is if there's like one common theme throughout it, then just like by tackling that, you're going to knock over a whole lot of um, some things. Yeah, what are you, what are you that's knocking over? right. Um, well, you're just knocking over um, dominoes. dominoes. You're knocking over dominoes. You know, like <laughs> this, this, uh, that one intervention that Rad shared on Monday is really quite profound. And, and you know, it's true what Phil says. If people were, and Rad mentioned this yesterday. We look for the magic bullet, right? The magic pill. We want this one thing that's going to just have this profound effect on every marker of, of health and performance. And that is literally the magic. And I think like particularly pill. with like gut health and microbiome stuff at the moment, the amount of, you know, supplements or foods that are claiming to be just, you know, incredible for for gut health, it's just, you know, you could really sink a lot of cash into um, yeah. yeah, trying to do that. But if you're constantly eating like crap, you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. not gonna get it does that. nothing. It absolutely yeah. does nothing. It's a, there's a, there was actually a really interesting study released uh, last year on supplementation and they weren't really deep on um, uh, and uh, on, on the most common uh, vitamins, minerals, and nutrition supplements that you can take. And uh, one of the ones that they found were the most useless out of all of them were probiotics. Right. They reckon that if it's not in a, um, in a liquid when you consume it, mm. uh, it's useless, like yeah. totally useless. So the, p the pill form yeah, of they're probiotics. All they're all dead, all the bacteria, yeah. all the time you get it in. Oh, so your cults are still on? Still well, on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that made cult. me question like whether your cult is, uh, I've never tried your cult, but we eat. But the, uh, big, the, big, the biggest problem is <laughs> that for food to go, at least in Australia, for food to be able to be consumed and sold, it has to be pasteurized. And the process of pasteurization, what it is, is to heat a food to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time to kill the bacteria. That's what they pasteurize food for. And they do it to standardize it so that they can confidently sell a thousand cartons of milk or whatever a day and know that none of them are gonna have any different bacteria than other ones because there's some bacteria that can mess up 
pregnancies and whatever. But so then when you get these foods that are about giving you bacteria, unfortunately, if you're buying a mass produced one like you could, it's pasteurized. And yeah. so maybe it had a lot of bacteria in it at one stage, but well, I think what they do is they try and it. put the b bacteria back in, the good bacteria back in. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I'm speaking way above my pay grade here. I don't know what they do. Well, I've got a PhD, do. so I'll, yeah. I'll uh, <laughs> let you guys know. Yeah, they put, they <laughs> provided <laughs> baloney is in your cult. Uh, but what I do know for a fact is that um, we are a very uh, we are a, a, a variety of different bacteria uh, there's a great book um, that I read a couple of years ago on this called 10% human and and it's a funny concept to get your head around but there is a lot of bacteria in our bodies and that is, and and some good and some bad um, especially in our guts and uh, that's how the whole system works and if it's in symbiosis and working together then it is going to work really well and you're going to be healthy and you're going to have healthy um, bowel movements and you're going to feel good and all sorts of stuff but if yeah, it, I mean the gut brain axis has been like a really interesting you know, space to watch where there's just seems to be so much um, yeah interplay between what's going on in your guts and what's going up going on in your brain in terms of mood and energy levels and everything so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty fascinating and, and that's something that I've gone really deep on because of my battles and 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 um, issues with depression and, and and psychological stuff and it's very very interesting if you've got a healthy gut you generally will be healthier everywhere if you've got a really unhealthy gut you generally will not be healthy everywhere you know so it's, uh, it's well worth um, going down that rabbit hole. And I'm going to share a couple of resources in the comments today again. Uh, there's a couple of great TED Talks that you guys can go and watch. They're nice. They're like, I like TED Talks because they're a really succinct presentation. They don't, they, they don't have time to waffle on, these guys. They have to really cut their presentation down to 20 minutes or less. I think it's 18 minutes is the cutoff when they start to get the nod. And so you get a, uh, a lot of research condensed into quite a, an impressive presentation. So we'll do that. We'll go ahead and do that. But let's talk a little bit about our experiences. And then uh, we'll talk about, um, uh, 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 we'll, we'll push the discussion into intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, and uh, upregulation of cellular healing pathways. And we do have the question of the day here in the live show about um, people's experience with intermittent fasting. So yeah, we'd love to hear some experience about it because, um, you know, it's can be really tough for some people some people love it yeah <laughs> um, and yeah we'll get into that later so if you do have any experience with it let us know yeah sounds good so uh who wants to share their first uh story about gut health or intermittent fasting or something along those lines well everybody's looking at me so i guess i'll go <laughs> um yeah look i when i was in my 20s um it uh, I, I just treated my body like a waste dump i didn't there was no i think the only reason that we weren't horrendously ill and overweight and everything like that is that our mother used to cook all our meals and they were all um pretty healthy like they were considered pretty healthy meals it was vegetables and meats and there were even times when we were kids where we were vegetarians um you know forced upon us because our dad's a vegetarian so we were definitely were exposed to eating vegetables and stuff and I do remember even through the worst of it because it was because when our parents split up and Yanni and I lived with dad dad just did zero cooking at all he basically just said go to the shops and buy your own food and so we were having microwave meals and things like that and just getting takeaway and whatever but I, I do remember um, th getting to a point where you'd there was something that was like, oh God, I need to eat something healthy. Like there was just a feeling within me. And, and then when Saskia, our sister came down to live with us and she was, she was a very early teenager. She would only been in her early teen years, but she really wanted to learn how to cook and she used to cook all the time. And I remember watching her cook and thinking, oh, I should try and do something and learning a little bit from her. And so that was the only reason why we weren't as bad as we really were. But I got to a point like, you know, as being a personal trainer and you start learning about nutrition and looking at what we ate and I was just like, oh my God, this is insane. And then no matter what I did, I, the older I got, when I got into my late 20s, what I really noticed, which is the story I shared yesterday, is how bloated my stomach was. And even though you could see abs on me, my gut was just bloated and poking out. And I started asking my mom about that and she told me what she knew about it and about inflammation and the, the general things that I could find. Like if you just do a basic Google search, the things that come up are 
um, you know, alcohol, uh, sugar, dairy, and gluten. They're whether they're true or not. You know, those are the things that a lot of people will say. You know, start by reducing those to reduce inflammation, and and it worked for me. And it was really really hard because I was having all of those in abundance. And the only way to really know if anything made an impact on you, because different people tolerate different things differently, is you have to re completely remove one but not the others, and you have to see if that makes a difference. Yep. And that was really really hard for me. It was hard to remo just remove one and focus on those, but Nonetheless, I did um, I did remove those uh, those foods all or one at a time, and it made a massive impact on me. And from there, that started the the look into the gut microbiome, and then I started learning about um, you know the importance of fermented foods and food varieties, and what some foods can do to negatively impact the microbiome, and what some foods can do to positively impact them. For me, it's been a probably a fifteen year journey that I'm still not 100% on and where I'm still at now is the big the big win that I've had lately is that I've um, now two years in a row I've had no alcohol for five months and this last year I actually did no alcohol for the three months leading up to New Year's Eve and we did have some drinks on New Year's Eve but I'm okay with that I made that decision and I'm, I consider myself now a non-drinker and now my next big thing is that I'm going to completely remove sugar and that's been the biggest hurdle for me I, I would be able to do it at, not at all during the week but uh, and, uh, um, on the weekends I would still have sugar and now I'm just going to completely remove it and uh, processed sugar refined sugar for anyone that's, if anybody wants to chime in and say what about fruit yes I'm going to still eat fruit and um, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating has been something that we've all experimented with for the last couple of years and and I did it um, for the health benefits. I just did it because you kept raving on about what the health benefits are and all the research and, and it was so much of it is about gut health. And I just thought, well, if there's all this research being done on something that helps gut health and this is good research that's being done. It's not, it's not just the hippie, you know, rags that you can find on Google, uh, you know, of somebody with no substantiated claims. It's, you know, this is good research. I thought, well, I better give that a try and it's all worked really well for me. Yep. So that's my experience. Yeah, I've had pretty limited uh, experience with like focusing on gut health, but one thing that I have really loved is uh, my dad has got really into making kombucha. It I was actually partially responsible. Yeah, for it her. was actually after the first time I was ever on the on this podcast when we were out in the um, main part of the gym. Looking back on those videos, it's um, yeah. <laughs> pretty up, pretty man. different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he thought I was drinking a beer at um, you know nine o'clock in the morning while I was being interviewed on your show, and uh, and afterwards he was like, oh, what's kombucha? And then I think it was one of the clients here um, who he s was trying to cut alcohol, so he swapped it out for kombucha, and then my dad was like, oh, that's a good idea. And so he started brewing his own. He makes his own, like, uh, labels on his batches. He's now, uh Kombuche. Kombuche, is, is Bruce, it? That's the new uh, one. Yeah. Bruce. So, yeah, he's got these, like, labels made up with the... Um, he's got two different types now. He's got uh, his regular uh, turmeric, ginger, and, and uh, lime, and then he's got the... Other one now is a hops one, so it's kind of like having a pale ale. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So it's like fermented black tea with a bit of hops. Yeah. And yeah, so that's like been a really effective way that he's been able to sub out alcohol, which obviously um, is one thing that Rabbit's is talking about as having a negative impact on gut health and replaced it with like a really satisfying sort of fizzy, you know, interesting drink to have when you just feel like you've had enough water for the day and you want something a bit different at night. And he's even made it sort of beery with the, yeah. the pale ale. So yeah, I'm so stoked for him. He's like, he's lost a bunch of weight and he's healthier than ever. So I just love that that one little intervention is not only, um, you know, had a good impact on his health, but also it's really fun. He's yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. given a good creative outlet. So And he's putting some really good healthy bacteria into his body. Yeah, 100%. So yeah. Um, yeah, for anyone out there who wants a new hobby, if you're <laughs> stuck at home all the time, you know, you might get a few exploding bottles every now and again, but <laughs> <laughs> we did. We we it's brewed our kombucha, our own kombucha for a few years, and it's just so delicious. It's so good having it, it on tap at home. When you get home, you just go, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, amazing. And what about uh, time restricted eating? Because um, you had a good That's, experience yeah. recently with metabolic flexibility with one of your friends. One of yeah, our yeah, exactly. Friends. Like I, it's something that I've quite enjoyed doing for a long time because I'd always just wake up feeling like. I don't know. When I wake up, I just do not feel like eating. Like I just, there's something about the thought of eating straight away that I just like can't handle. So, and you know, you kind of get indoctrinated into that breakfast is the most important meal of the day and like eat your wheat bix like a good, you know, young Australian yep, kid yep. who should like cricket but doesn't. <laughs> um, but then like, <laughs> so that was kind of the, like, you know, I'd always just feel so sick and then I'd get really hungry by the time that like, you know, 
like I remember in school just being like recess coming around at like ten thirty and just being like I can't yeah, wait to eat like I need can't function anymore yeah, basically yeah. and so it's been a really sort of nice change realizing like hey you know maybe humans didn't evolve always having like you know we fix an orange juice in the morning, morning yeah. like <laughs> maybe we can survive longer than you know two like, hours without food yeah, yeah. and so you kind of got quite into giving that a go and um, yeah it's just been so amazing I feel so much better in the morning and I'm just um, yeah I really enjoy it and I love how it has um, like doing some exercise in the morning I usually suck at the work but I also, and I got quite used to um, doing some you know cardio of some sort often playing beach volleyball um, faster and it was really just quite an interesting experience with one of my best mates who is a big trainer into his powerlifting into his crossfit really fit dude and um, we went out for a cycle and it was about 80 k's and um, I, I'd sort of just went off with you know just a black coffee and and by the time we got to like this hill about f like 10 k's out of town he's like dude we have to stop for food and I was like, what are you talking about we like just started yeah. <laughs> it's like, no really like I had breakfast three hours ago and I I'm dying here, I'm like, <laughs> mate. What? what? <laughs> and so we, you know, stopped over, pulled over. He bought a bunch of food, kept cycling, and then like another hour later, he's like, mate, when are we having lunch? I'm like, I'm, I'm starving over here. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but just having exposed my body to uh, exercising without um, without having like immediate fuel sources means that you've got that metabolic and the term metabolic flexibility means that like my body is not only like hell bent on relying on sugar to burn it, it can use other fuel sources so namely fat which you are mostly yep. using in a um yeah fasted state especially at lower intensities so it's been quite interesting to see that like performance benefit um yep. which i think you know if you uh you know survival wise makes a lot of sense <laughs> it makes a whole lot of sense a whole lot of sense and we're going to go really deep in that in just a second I, I, but before i do and before i share my experience with time restricted eating and intermittent fasting uh i want to just wrap up the the gut, um, the gut component of this discussion, because uh, you know, as I said, you know, none of us are, none of us are, are, are really, really um, adept on the research on this, and it, and and the reason is that it's a, quite a new space. Uh, the gut microbiome, they're they're, do, they're doing a good study here in Sydney. It's called the Gut Microbiome Project. You can Google that, and you can look. They put a lot of their uh, research and data available to everyone online. It's it's happening at Sydney University here, and it's a very interesting space to keep an eye on. What we do know for a fact is that the gut microbiome can be changed quicker than we first thought. It can happen in as little as sort of three days uh, uh, if you change the way you eat. We do know for a fact, as Phil said, that there is a very, very strong link between what's happening in your gut and how you, what's happening in your brain. And, and as a result, um, what you eat has an effect on how you feel physically, energy levels, um, uh, optimism, <laughs> brain fog, anxiety, depression, all of these things are affected by the state of your gut. And what, what's most important for people to understand is that it's actually what determines the foods that you crave. The bacteria in your gut uh, thrives on what you eat. So it creates this circle where what you're eating is cultivating the gut microbiome, the bacteria in the gut, and that bacteria in the gut is uh, producing feelings, sensations, urges in your brain that help you stay in that loop. So if you're very used to eating junk food, then your gut microbiome will be programmed to want to consume yeah, that amazing. junk food. I hadn't thought about it like that, but yeah, the thing that's getting the most feed will, food will obviously grow the most and then be that's the... That's exactly yeah, right. right. And then that's the strongest oh, that's um, so uh, urges so that you get. <laughs> so it's creating this cycle that's very hard yeah. to break out of because here's the thing. To ch although we can change the gut microbiome in, in as little as three days, during the process of changing it, the bacteria that was thriving on the foods you were eating prior to the change are going to have to start to die. <laughs> and during that process, they really make you feel like crap. Put up a fight. <laughs> yeah, they, put, they really put up a fight. And so often it's very difficult for people to get... Uh, to get through that period, we call it the transition period in our protocol here at, at Unity Gym. 
And the easiest way to do it is literally to go cold turkey. Uh, we start with a carbohydrate deload because most of the uh, the abundant um, gut bacteria is um, uh, is cultivated by in in a Western diet anyway is cultivated by eating highly processed carbohydrates. That's what we tend to have grown up on. Wheat bix is a good example for breakfast, you know. And uh, and so what we do is we do a week long gut um, uh, repair protocol, which is where we just deload people from refined and processed carbohydrates and sugar. And on the last day, we have zero carbohydrate and sugar. And that's not because we are um, uh, high fat, high protein diet zealots. We we just uh, like to really kick it in the gut, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Uh, get rid of that bacteria quickly and it and it's like tearing off a band-aid so for that week you can feel pretty lousy but we get it over and done with and then you can move on and rebuild and recultivate your gut microbiome so the keys here so i don't ramble on about this for too long is that we uh we basically reset the gut over a three to seven day period by removing the foods that are most problematic to you um step by step uh you know it's kind of hard to do it all in one go and if you do do that that's an option you're going to feel like crap so just embrace that you know for three to seven days you can feel really lousy and it really depends on how bad your diet was uh, your your gut's going to be completely programmed your gut microbiome is going to be um, uh, nourished by the foods you were eating and if you want to change that you're going to have to sort of let that transition period occur does that make sense yeah, have i made it. that yeah. simple enough yep mm -hmm. okay so um if you if you are ch changing your diet just embrace that transition period it's going to suck uh, make sure you don't have anything really important on at work that you have to do because you're going to get brain fog you're going to get moody you're going to be really snappy you're going to find it hard to do things like problem solving uh, and i find that it's best to do over a weekend so you don't go into a really important meeting and just tank it you know like if you've got a sales pitch to do or something like that you're going to lose that uh, in a big way because your brain's just not going to function very well. So um, my experience with time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting came about after having my first child. I'd never tried it up until that point. And uh, I have, a, uh, like uh, most of the study that I do nowadays, guys, I have a, um, a, um, a confession to make. It doesn't have a lot to do with health. It's more about finance uh, because of the position I'm in in the gym and it's more about business. Uh, and so I have chosen a few people who I uh, believe are authorities in the industry of health and fitness. Uh, Phil is one of them. Um, uh, a, good, uh, a good friend and old mentor of mine, Tony Bataji, is one of them. We have a great friend, Aaron McKenzie, who has a business called Origin of Energy, who's one of them. And I have um, uh, faith in these guys because they're very, very um, um, passionate about staying up to date with research and things like that. And, and so I sort of watch, and there's, other, there's many others, and I, uh, um, probably a, a half a dozen people that I really, really um, uh, believe are on the, on, have their finger on the pulse with what's going on in the world. Um, John Berardi's one of them from Precision Nutrition. Uh, and I just keep, keep looking at what these guys are posting about and talking about and blogging about. And, uh, and when, they start, when they all start to talk about something, I pay attention. Ben one Pekulski is another good one. Ben Pekulski is another good one. Uh, and, and they all started talking about time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. Um, there's a great podcast called Found My Health by Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Uh, she's another person that I follow. Uh, Lane Norton is another person that I follow and really um, trust. Uh, and I noticed that there was a trend with a lot of them talking about this thing called time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting a few years ago. And I started to pay attention. Then after we had our first child, I was heavily impacted. My sleep was impacted and that then bled, it, bled out to other areas of my life and I stopped exercising as much and I started eating a little bit more. We got a bit lazy around the house because we were just exhausted and we didn't prepare as much food. We, we ate takeout a bit more and things like that as we were trying to adjust to having a new baby in the house. And it wasn't long before I stepped on the scales and noticed that I'd put on eight kilos, which was the most fat I'd, I've ever put on in my entire life. And, uh, and it really knocked me. I was like, wow, I've got to get on top of this. So I went back to really b doing the things I used to do. And I, and it was, I was in my 30s. I was uh, mid-30s at the time. 
And I noticed that it was just really hard to shift the weight. I, I couldn't exercise to the intensity and duration that I used to. And the uh, things that I used to do, which was just to remove processed foods and, and uh, eat high protein uh, and low carb, just didn't shift the weight very quickly at all. Like I was losing weight, but God, it was happening slowly and it wasn't very motivating. I was starting to get quite demotivated. So I thought, wow, I'm going to try something different. And, uh, and that's when I decided I've been reading about this, uh, this time restricted eating, intermittent fasting. And I thought maybe I'll just try that. Maybe that will get, uh, give me the nudge that I needed. And so I started doing a 16, eight time restricted eating regime. Uh, the difference between time restricted eating and, and intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting actually means the abstinence from food for 24 or more hours. So most people that think they're doing intermittent fasting are actually doing what's referred to as time restricted eating, which is really just having uh, blocks of time where you consciously do, do not consume food or liquid that has anything other than sort of water or, or uh, black tea or coffee in it. And, uh, and so the, the most obvious one is 16-8. A lot of people talk about that. You can even do 12-12 uh, to get started. And it really had quite a profound effect on me. Not only did I notice that I lost the weight really quickly, so so quickly that uh, Kalisha jumped on board and uh, she started doing it as well to lose her sort of um, mother baby gaining weight. But it actually improved my mental state and it had quite a profound effect on my mental state. It, it made me feel sharper when I was not eating. I, f I got more work done. I was more productive. I was more effective at what I was doing. And um, very quickly, I started to find that it improved my performance uh, in the morning when I was training. Uh, in a fasted state, I started to have more energy in my training sessions and I started to really notice, you know, initially I started only doing it two days a week and then I started doing it five days a week and I was still just eating whatever on the weekends. And then I just noticed that whenever I ate, I felt like crap. So I just started doing it on the weekends as well. And the only time I ever faltered from that regime of having breakfast at midday at 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon was if we had like a social event that was like a meetup with friends and we had breakfast at 10. But I always had breakfast and then I'd need to just go and lay down for a while. Like it was like, like taking a sleeping pill, you know? And so there was just no, I, I just thought, why would I do that to myself, especially when I'm at work, you know? So it had all these really, really quite profound effects. And, and, and I, I, then what I do naturally after I have such a good result with something is I go deeper into it, learning about, okay, what's going on? Why is this happening? And I started to study more and more. And that's when I was referred by Tony Vitaji uh, to, to check out Dr. Rhonda Patrick because she just has this amazing podcast and interviews so many amazing people. And uh, she had interviewed a couple of the sort of um, authorities in time restricted eating, intermittent fasting, who are conducting most of the research on this. And, and I noticed that uh, there was a series, there was a consistent theme going on every year. There's Nobel Prize, um, uh, Nobel Prizes awarded in all these different categories. And in the category of health and medicine, the uh, two Nobel Prizes for 2016, 17, or might've might been 15, 16, were awarded to people uh, for their discoveries in uh, what's called circadian rhythm and circadian health. And it was very, very correlated to this concept of time restricted eating. And so I started to really notice that this was a really, really big, important area of research that we're learning more and more about. And, uh, and I got very, very passionately into it and following it. And now I'm a big proponent of time restricted eating, circadian rhythm, circadian health, and how that affects your health. And what I'm going to do, because we don't have time to really dive into it here today, but I'm going to link a few of the TED Talks and a couple of the interviews that I'm talking about here with Donda, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Um, and so you guys can, can dive down the rabbit hole if you want to, too. But what I'll leave the... Um, uh, discussion today on is just quickly go around the room for everyone who's uh, experimented with this a little bit. F Phil's already shared, but he he can repeat that again to summarize, and Rad can share as well. The big things for me were that I found, and th and this is very important, is that when you start time restricted eating, and we've had some good um, feedback here. You know, Roy Stern said it was easy, and he's losing weight. Jody Buttle saying intermittent fasting again now eating between twelve and seven. PM easy at the moment, but found it harder when training at Unity Gym at lunch, not eating till after two. She's saying love kombucha. It untethers you from food. And what that means is that you become 
able to skip meals and it doesn't affect you. It doesn't knock your world out. To give you an example, um, um, uh, uh, Phil's friend who he went on the cycle with is very tethered to food. Oh, yeah. He couldn't cycle for 10 minutes without eating, you know, and, uh, and th this was a very powerful thing. And I know that Radix had, had the same experience. And then the other thing for me obviously was that it improved my performance and it, improved, it made it easier for me to maintain a healthy <coughs> body composition, lean and muscular physique. And it made it um, very, very easy for me to stay productive at work. And I still have this problem. We eat around 12, one o'clock. And after that, my productivity just tanks. I just get go, oh God, I, I, uh, in the morning I'm time really switched yeah. on. Yeah, it really <laughs> makes you feel like time for a nap. And I watch yeah. it happen to Rad every day too. He goes and eats and then he has to have a nap straight after. I mean, he's up early and starting very early in the morning. Uh, so he's already been at work for the, like the average work day by that time. But uh, it definitely does trigger something in your body where you just go, oh, God, I've got to digest this food now. Yeah. But for anyone giving it a go, like, it, and that people, I think that some people are kind of naturally find it very, like, you know, Roy Stern saying here that he found it really easy. But, um, yeah, some people find it really hard and it takes, like, a couple of, you know, even a couple of weeks to kind of get into the rhythm of it and then it kind of becomes easy from there. So I, I, I think, was one of those people yeah. and I'll just finish on that. Um, for the first two weeks that I started experimenting with time-restricted eating, I felt terrible. I'm telling you now, I was one of those people who had trained my body to need food every two to three hours because I was heavily into bodybuilding for a decade. And I used to carry a six pack lunch box around, which had six individual lunch boxes that I, that were filled with meat and veg that I ate throughout the day, uh, every two hours, literally. And I had a timer on my phone to tell me when it was time to take my supplements, my protein shakes and my meals. And, uh, and it was very hard to break that cycle because I'd trained my gut, I'd trained my body, and I thought I was dying the first couple of times I did a fast. Like literally, I just was like, this is not natural. There's something, I'm, I'm at risk of actually affecting my health here. And that is often the case. And I'm telling you now, it's only the case because you're not metabolically flexible. Your body is so attuned to getting these huge dumps of uh, sugar or carbohydrate or glycogen, whatever you want to call that energy substrate, um, uh, on a regular basis, whether it's through the sugar in your coffee or tea, whether it's through the fruits or snacks that you're eating in between meals, or whether it's through the meals themselves. And so um, you just have to persevere through that point because there are some amazing health benefits to it. Rad, do you want to share your experience when you started intermittent fasting to wrap this up? Or should we let Phil finish? Or? Oh, no, no, that's all I have wanted to say. Oh, it's yeah. just like, for some people it is just hard. So it's hard. Um, but stick with it. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was tough. Uh, it was tough for me, but I'm, I'm a little bit more hardcore than Yanni, so I didn't find it that hard. Um, I sorted it out and just pushed through. <laughs> nah, it was hard. The first, few, <laughs> the first few weeks were hard. I went back and forth, but I just did it. I don't, um, I, I, um, yeah, look, I've I've been through some pretty tough stuff in the military and with my um, martial arts training, so I'm a little bit more seasoned to discomfort, discomfort than the average person. So yeah, I and just did it. And <laughs> that's probably that's probably a point to highlight. You know, it, it, um, being uncomfortable is actually a really healthy thing to experience. Yeah. I think one know? of the biggest problems with people in with humanity these days, and of course I can only talk about what I see, and uh, I mean, I don't know what it's like everywhere in the world, but as a general, as a gross generalization, I think that people are wrapped in cotton wool way too much these days. And you hear about people talking about the problems that they have and how hard it is to not eat and stuff, and then you look at, you go to other places in the world where people are, are begging to get a handful of rice a day, you know? Um, and people, are, you know, talk about how hard it is to not eat food. And, for and I'll point 16 out, sixteen hours or something. Survive yeah. very well on a tiny portion of rice yeah. and get a lot more physical activity done in a day than most yeah. of us do. You yeah. know. And I just think, like, when you really, when you really weigh things up and you look at what what li the way that life survives and the way that we deal with it, I think one of the one of the best things that you can do for yourself is intentionally put yourself through some hardship and intentionally make some hard choices do some things that are uncomfortable expose yourself to that thing and, and i think intermittent fasting is a really really easy thing that anybody can do like a lot of people will you know go and climb mount kilimanjaro to expose themselves to something that's challenging and you've got to pay a lot of money and go overseas and take time off work and you know try just not eating for half a day and you know 
yeah. expose yourself to something that's going to give you a little bit of uncomfort and, and, and a lot of health. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Blakely said here, I've done intermittent fasting. Welcome to the stream, Blakely. Um, he's one of our amazing moderators and admins to the group. I've done IF for years and just started eating breakfast again, trying to pack on muscle. It sucks. I hate eating this much. I, I still take a 24 hour fast once a week. It's um, the only thing keeping me sane, which is awesome. And, uh, and that's something that I do too. I do a 24 hour fast every Monday. Uh, Rad did that recently too. And on this note, you know, um, intermittent fasting, we are not intermittent fasting zealots. There are many ways to skin a cat when it comes to nutrition. And really you've got to find if you, if you're someone who's trying to manage your weight, it may not be the best thing to do because trust me, when I say this, you can binge way too much calories in a small eating window if you're not doing it for the right reasons. If you're trying to, um, l do intermittent fasting just to lose weight, I, I, I say tread with a, an error of caution because you can uh, experience quite severe food cravings which end up stuffing the whole process up. And to give you an example, Richard, because one of his primary goals is to finally break through the three inch uh, diameter calf um, uh, size that he has ha suffered with most of his life. And so he has never intermittent fast. Uh, to my knowledge, he doesn't do it uh, uh, on a regular basis at least because his goal is to, like Richard, similar to me um, uh, years ago, is naturally quite a tall skinny guy and so his goal is to maintain muscle mass and it's not necessarily the best diet for for that for bodybuilding you know bodybuilding is a is, is an art form of both absolutely destroying your body on a regular basis through exercise and then recovering through how much recovery rest you get and how much food you can consume you know and Blakely's talking here about how he's trying to pack on some muscle rad did that last year for the most of the year really you your goal was muscle mass gain so you stopped doing Absolutely. time restricted eating it yeah time restricted eating yeah there you go and so we're not by any um shape or measure um uh, uh like enforcing or, or or what do you call it like zealot uh, uh int intermittent fasting zealots but uh you know we do really appreciate when something has a profound effect on one's health and it certainly is a great way to upregulate um healing pathways like cellular autophagy but let me be absolutely clear. There are other ways to do that. Yeah, it's a great tool and you yeah. can use it sometimes. You don't have to use it all the time. That's right. Yeah. I'll, I'll share with you exercise and any caloric deficit will upregulate cell autophagy. Intermittent fasting is not the only way, but it is a very effective way of doing so. So uh, something to consider. And if you would like to dive down the rabbit hole of uh, intermittent fasting, we have a really great progressive intermittent fasting program that we give our tribe here at Unity Gym. Uh, and it is actually going to be available with the flash sale this weekend. Uh, this weekend, we're doing a flash sale for one of our stretching programs, and we're giving away that intermittent fa progressive intermittent fasting program with uh, that course. And it is it, it includes that seven day carbohydrate deload. We plan it out for you and everything. It's quite an effective little uh, little system of nutrition intervention. So check that out if you haven't got it already. A lot of you guys probably already have it because we often give it away as a bundle with the programs we sell. Uh, tomorrow we're wrapping up this, uh, this discussion with um, how to maximize muscle protein synthesis to improve performance and recovery. We're doing that live stream uh, to our Unity Gym Tribe only, but we will share the video to you guys. The reason why we're doing it to our Gym Tribe is because we've got 25 new people doing our 28-day uh, intensive, and we want to answer their questions. And it's very specific for these guys because they've just done a radical lifestyle intervention, which is going from not that much physical exercise to five days a week of physical exercise. And we need these guys to learn how to build their diets around the dietary protein requirements requirements specific to their body mass. So we're going to be going deep into that. If you want to catch that discussion, we will post the video afterwards to this group. So it will be made available to you. You just won't be able to see it live and answer questions. So for everybody in the UMS Movement Mastermind, we're not going to see you guys live until Monday here Sydney time. For everyone in our UMS online coaching, we'll see you as regularly uh, 9.15 tomorrow, straight after we go live to the Unity Gym Tribe group uh, for your weekly group coaching call. Uh, get your questions in, post your videos, uh, and uh, we'll be on there to give you that support. And for everyone in the Unity Gym Tribe, uh, like Jody. 
Uh, get ready for the deep dive tomorrow to wrap this nutrition discussion up, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Rad. Thank you, Richie. We'll see you all tomorrow or Monday. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept what you're going to have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that far. It's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcut to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. It's the gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.